this one work? Okay, how's the sound? Not yet? Okay. Right, yeah, so David's talk is actually an excellent lead into it, to what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about this um, agent-based model of Chinook small migration <clears throat> through the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. And this is a project that we're working on at the NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center. And it's, it's part of um, one of many life cycle modeling efforts. So this particular model that I'm going to tell you about has two goals. One is to support these life cycle modeling efforts uh, by helping us understand how survival through the delta changes under different conditions. Um, but also, we think it'll be a good model to ask questions just about the behavior of the fish in general. So form hypotheses about what they might be doing and then use this model to test it. Uh, before I go on, I also want to acknowledge Russell Perry, who has been helping us with the calibration bit of this, which, uh, as anybody who has done this sort of stuff knows, that can be one of the more difficult parts of it. So, so first, to uh, remind everybody about the situation that these Chinook smolts face as they're going through the delta. From a big picture, there's two main inflows into the delta. There's the Sacramento River from the north, and then the San Joaquin River flowing in from the south. Those come together in the delta, and then flow out through a few different bays. And so, um, the, the fish also are affected by these export facilities, which David talked about. There's the State Water Project and the Central Valley Proje Project, which export water down to the south for various agricultural and municipality uses. And another landmark in the system is Chips Island, which um, is important for a number of reasons. Once, uh, one is that it sort of indicates when the fish have run the gauntlet and made it through the delta. Another thing that is important about Chips Island is they have trawls that sample there, so we have a lot of good data about fish that are released upstream, and then how many of them make it to Chips Island. So we have extended the DSM-2 model of the Department of Water Resources, and that model models the delta by overlaying this network of channels and nodes. So if you zoom in on one section of this, you'll see this, this network of, they call, call it quasi-three-dimensional um, nodes and channels. So a channel flows into a node. Some of the nodes have branches where you can uh, go down one of two or more channels. And so DSM-2 is great because it gives us hydrology information, flow information. And then it has a base particle tracking model in it, which is the one that David was talking about, that treats fish or generally particles as neutrally buoyant passive particles that are moved by advection. And when they reach a node, they have some probability of going down the different branches, and that probability is proportional to the flow in the different branches. So what we've done, because uh, it's pretty widely recognized that behavior is really important for the fates of these fish, is extend this model to try to add in biologically reasonable behaviors of, of the Chinook smolts. So one thing we've done is add in swimming behaviors. So the motion of the fish is now a combination of advection and then also uh, a number of different swimming behaviors that we, might, that we might try. And then also we can add in more complex routing decisions at these nodes. So this is an individual-based model that can allow us to, to track the individual fates of fish that are released into the delta. So this list is far from definitive, and in fact, it's out of date. We've added um, four or five more behaviors that um, we're interested in exploring to see if they fit the data well. Um, but I'm going to talk about three of these and show sort of qualitative results from three of these. Uh, what I want to really emphasize is that this is very preliminary. We're, we're still working on the calibration phase of the model, which which is really key, so take these with a grain of salt. But uh, at this stage, I think we, we have seen some interesting qualitative results, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about these three behaviors. One is the 
the null model, which is part of the base DSM-2 particle tracking model. And then I'm going to talk about this behavior number four, which you can think of it as a, sort of an extreme selective tidal stream transport, where when the flow is going downstream, they'll swim with it. When the flow is going upstream, they hold. So they're always moving downstream towards the ocean. And then another I'm going to talk about is where we've implemented a diurnal swimming behavior, where they, they swim, for example, during the night and hold during the day. And the important thing about this behavior, as opposed to, to number four there, is that it includes advection. So the fish can be swept back by the influence of, of the reverse tidal flows. Another thing that we've incorporated into this model, which we think is important, is mortality. So we're using this XT model that was put together by Jim Anderson and all. Um, and it's called the XT model because the probability of survival is a function of the distance traveled, so that's X, as well as the amount of time spent traveling. And then you'll see two other parameters in there. One is this lambda, which is the mean free path. You can think of that as the distance between predator encounters. And then another parameter is this random movement. So you can think of that as either the, the random movement of the, of the smolts, or you can think of it also as the random movement of any predators that may be in the system. So this mean free path has two components in it. One is the density of the predators, and then another is what's called the predator's reaction distance. And it might help to look at this in cartoon form. So on the, the bottom left there is a smolt that's going to be running the gauntlet of these fish. And there's a path drawn in there with a lot of meandering, random move, movement. And so you can imagine that if the fish is moving in that way, that it can encounter the same predator multiple times. So that'll increase the probability that it's going to get eaten. Whereas if it were to take a more directed path with less random movement, it would be less likely to be eaten. Okay, so this is a snapshot from our, our particle tracking model that shows the, the circles there are individual fish. So this is just an example where we released 1,000 fish in the Georgiana Slough. And the blue ones are the ones that are still alive at this point in time. Yellow ones have, have been predated. And then you can also see in red is the upstream flow, and green is downstream. So you can see that there's the influence of the tide in the inner delta there. And then Chips Island and the export facilities. And I don't have time to go into the model calibration bit, but just to give you the 60,000 foot view of it, we have the particle tracking model that we can we, we have multiple parameters that affect mortality and swim behaviors and swim speeds. And then we can compare that to either coded wire tag data, or, which is what we're doing right now, or in the future, we're also going to be using acoustic telemetry data. And you can sweep these parameters and get a likelihood that the PTM would have generated the results that you see. And then we're going to use a MCMC approach to, to get distributions on these parameters. So this is a historical look at flow. These are monthly averages in the delta. And so you can see there's a lot of seasonality. There's change from one year to the other. And then the exports also have a lot of variation. And so you can lump these inflows and exports together, plot them against each other, and you get a sort of picture like this, where you can think of inflow on the x-axis as being beneficial in terms of getting the fish through the system, and then exports potentially could draw the fish down to the south where, where they will be entrained. And one way people have looked at this often is export inflow ratios. So the higher this ratio, the higher the exports are relative to the inflows. So you can think of higher being potentially worse for the fish. So what I'm going to show you, again, these are preliminary qualitative results but we chose 11 scenarios, so each one of these is going to be a month, to represent sort of the range of con conditions that have been seen over the years that, that we can model. And I'm going to show you a few different release locations. 
So the first one is Discovery Park up in the main stem of the Sacramento River. And I'm going to show you many plots that look like this. So just to orient you, in the bottom left will be a reminder always of where the release location was. And then the plot, of course, shows the exports versus inflows. And then along the bottom, you'll see the color code for the fates of the fish. So blue is chips, and then the predated one, again, those are yellow. And then you'll see the entrainment as a green or red, or at least hopefully you can see that. So let's start out with one release scenario under very low inflow and very low exports. Oh, and the other thing is this is for the null model. So this is the, the base PTM behavior, and you'll see that in the upper right. So if you just have passive particles and you have very low inflows and exports, there's not much motivating the fish through the system. So most of them just sort of languish and get predated. As you increase the exports, you get some that end up getting entrained in the system. Most of them still die. And then as you move towards increased inflows, you have more motivating the fish through the system. So in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to sort of speed this up a bit. So now this is the second behavior, which is, again, the really aggressive selective tidal, tidal stream transport, where they have swimming ability. So they, a lot of them make it to chips regardless of the export inflow ratio. And this is the behavior where they have the diurnal swimming behavior. Again, since they can swim and since they start off far from the export facilities, a lot of them make it to Chips Island, um, but a lot of them also are predated. So what happens if we give them a head start and release them in Georgiana Slough instead? The, the, the pattern with the, the passive model is sort of similar, where as you have higher exports, more of them get entrained, and then as you have higher inflows, more of them are successfully able to make it through the system. Now that we've given them a head start, the really aggressive STST behavior uh, has, shows a lot of them making it to Chips Island. So already you're seeing that behavior really makes a big difference here. And then for this release location, the diurnal swimming behavior with advection is just slightly less effective at getting the fish through the system. Okay, finally, what happens if they start off down in the San Joaquin? So this is much closer to the export facilities. You can imagine that they're going to be much more affected by them. And that's what you see with the, with the null or passive model. Since you're starting so close to the export facilities, a lot of them get entrained by those flows. And only at the higher inflows do you get a significant number making it to chips. Um, with even with the sort of aggressive behavior, some of them are getting entrained in the state water project. And then here's where you see the big difference between the second two behaviors, where even when they're swimming, when they have a possibility of being advected back upstream, starting in the San Joaquin is, is bad in terms of being entrained in the export facilities. Okay, so that's sort of an overview of the sort of results that we're hoping to get out of this, this model. Um, so as they say, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. So we're going to talk a bit about what we think the benefits are of the mechanistic approach that we're taking. So one benefit is that you can capture some of the nonlinearities that might exist in the system. So for example, you might look at two release times that have very similar export to inflow ratios. So I've just chosen two up here. And you might predict, based on their similarity in terms of, of this metric, that they would have very similar results, very similar fates of the fish. But when we, when we actually model it, we see that that's not true, that we get very different results. So again, these are similar export to inflow ratios, but releases were done at different times, different years. And so... If with this mechanistic model, we can look closely and see what is the explanation for this pattern. And hopefully you can see on the left, this is the behavior or the release time when a lot of fish were able to make it to chips. And there's this sort of critical junction that's by Frank, Frank's tract there 
where when these fish happened to hit that junction, the tide was going out. So they, they were fortunate in their timing, whereas the group on the right, the tide was going, it was, it was a flood tide right when they hit that critical junction, and so they were swept back into the interior delta. Another benefit of this more mechanistic approach is that we can explore novel scenarios. So the blue dots are the historical exports and inflows over the period from 1990 to 2007. But with this model, we haven't done this yet, but one thing that we will be able to do is look at basically any combination of inflow and exports that we want to that we want to try. So in conclusion, we found that flow really does make a big difference in the fate of these fish. And behavior really does matter, as, as David was emphasizing. And we think that this mechanistic approach can, can help uh, add to what we understand about the system. And there was a lot of effort going into developing this model. And then, like I said, the calibration work is still ongoing. And I want to acknowledge uh, some of the folks that have been working with us on this, uh, both at NOAA and the Department of Water Resources, USGS, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, which has provided a lot of the data that we're using for calibration. So I don't know how we are on time, but plenty of time? OK, great. I could have talked more slowly. Um, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Is, is it, do you see that it would be feasible to run this model in sort of continuous time in the sense that you could have a trickle release of fish daily and you're running it and, and you're aggregating results over many, many days or weeks? Is that possible? Yeah, that's one of the nice things about DSM-2 is they have a lot of these sort of functionalities already built into it. So right now what we're modeling are releases on a single day because we're trying to match some of these experimental coded wire tag releases. But by all means, you can, you can have fish trickle in every day or a certain number per day, or there's a lot of flexibility in terms of that. What were the, the main things that you were thinking we could learn from that sort of experiment? Well, I, I was just thinking that, that it, you really want to be able to try to match some of the longer-term statistics, uh, the aggregate statistics over longer time frames, and, and try to help explain some of these results that people are getting where, where flow doesn't seem to matter in some of these aggregate statistics. And it might be because it just all washes out as the fish trickle through the system. Some, yeah. you know, they're, they're, those junction choices that versus the tides, they all kind of wash against each other, and you end up with kind of no relationship. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the scenario that I showed where the fish were unfortunate when they reached that particular junction, that was a, a group of fish that was released more or less at the same time. And so that, that result really jumped out. But probably if you were to release those fish over a period of a week, you might you might not really see that effect because they'll be hitting that junction over you know more of a range of, of times in terms of the tidal cycle. So yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, thank you, Doug. I enjoyed your presentation too. Uh, the comments I made for Dave David apply here too, of course, but uh, in the course of time that we've been doing these studies, we we learned some unfortunate lessons about the evolution of technology. Uh, so initially, we tried to use one model and, and couple our biophysical model to it. But of course, as Steve points out, models evolve, and there's already better, better models. Uh, so uh, the way we uh, solve that problem is that we require our CFD to be in tech plot output, which most CFD codes can generate. So therefore, that, that separates us from the CFD technology. And we can keep pace, at least within reason, uh, as the CFD technology uh, advances, which it does. Now, there are two biophysical models that I'm aware of. Uh, the other one is University of Iowa. Uh, they invested in Fluent. So their biophysical model is a module within Fluent. So the advantage for them is it runs faster. Right. And they don't have to have this big intermediate uh, data set, which is advantages. But on the other hand, they're enslaved to Fluent, 
and they can't use, uh, you know, if you have an agency partner that already has a CFD model for a system and it's not fluent, then they can't apply it. Yeah, I think this is always tricky. There's always the tension between complexity and tractability. And so our approach to this has been to try to be as parsimonious as possible, start off with the simple, simplest model that we can, and only add complexity when it turns out that it's necessary in order to, to capture the behavior that, that, we're, that we're looking at. So, yeah. Yeah, I want to reiterate uh, John's comment about uh, these, these point releases. In the North Delta now, we release continuously for exactly the reasons you talk about. And so when Fish, um, David, when Fish uh, arrived at um, Turner Cut, it was over like a week or so, week? For each release, it could be up to 14 days, but okay. usually about a week. And so if your OMR was in a 14-day average? Uh, we use a seven day, the first okay. seven days. Okay, so that's, that's the issue of time scales, right? If, you, if you're going to compare... Um, fish going by a junction to a 14-day average quantity, then you need to have a lot of fish go by during that 14-day period and do this similar averaging. And so this, the same thing applies to the model. It's a lot more expensive, of course, to do it in the field, but the reason we've gone to continuous releases is we want to have fish experience the flood tide exit, the ebb tide exit, and all of those conditions, and then aggregate that over time. Right, yeah. Uh, so, so in your case, uh, you did a binomial probability, and when they died, um, you stopped them. Right. Yeah. So the the yellow circles that that was the sort of shows you the location in which that coin flip became true, and they died. Yeah. So have you looked at any of the Lagrangian tracks? Um, tried to look at ones that died versus lived, what they experienced, um, because DM, the, the model has some other things in there besides. Because the one way they're really dying in your case is distance traveled and some presumed predator interaction that's implicit rather than explicit, right? right? So you might look also at, at, at uh, some of the Lagrangian tracks of the individuals to see. You may have done that already, but there's, there may be some information in there about... Uh, Good, good paths to take and bad paths to take that, that uh, may be of interest. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea, and, and that's something we definitely are looking forward to doing. Once we have sort of a suite of behaviors that are plausible, then look at what the implications of the different behaviors are in terms of what path they take, what their total travel distance is, um, what their travel time is, and all of these sorts of things. And then... One bit I didn't didn't mention, but um, Russell Perry has been looking at how uh, predation or survival varies throughout the delta. So right now we're just looking at a single predation uh, parameterization for the entire delta, but obviously that's that's not um, not realistic. So we're going to be looking at uh, breaking it up into different regions and having different predation rates for those. I guess I was just going to make a comment that the fact that the swimming behavior matters is hardly surprising. There have been yeah. literally hundreds of papers published showing this in estuarine systems, estuarine coastal systems. So I guess it shouldn't be a surprise. It's just the interesting part is it seems like constraining it with appropriate behaviors and also you know, possibly the right kind of physics. I mean, I think things John was showing that the junctions may not look like big washing machines like DSM-2 assumes they are that the fact that things maybe start off on the left and end up on the channel that goes to the left versus ones that are on the right go to the channel on the right or even more complicated physical processes, John showed. I, I think yeah. before you go into a lot of effort of calibrating with DSM-2, assuming that that gets the, the particle positions exactly right other than swimming, I would consider seriously trying to go to a better model. Yeah, that's always the tricky part, like I say, the tension between between adding things that you know are real. So we know that when fish reach these junctions, they don't really just get randomly mixed up and then put to one channel or the other. The question is whether, whether you can um, not ignore that, but 
whether you can sort of fold that in to your uncertainty and still get a good approximation of, of how the system is working. Well, that, that but, would be a thing you could, with a model you think is better, Yeah. you can see, do you get about the same result, say, for some limited subset of cases, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and that would also, sort of an that advantage. Would, oh, sorry, go ahead. like I say, that would also bear on John's comment about building um, building it as something a little more portable. The, the PTM is Java, which is a very difficult thing to otherwise mess with. It's not doesn't really play nicely with things like Fortran codes. Although, thankfully, it's open source, so that's been a huge advantage for us because we are able to we're we're able to add. Basically, the sky is the limit. We're able to add any sort of behaviors that we want. Um, so, so yeah, that's a real strength of of this open source, object oriented platform that that DWR has created. But yeah. Thank you. I think you said you were doing this, but I just want to be clear. In your sort of model calibration, you're um, comparing the results of uh, the uh, particle tracking model with different behaviors against things like the coded wire or the, the uh, coded wire tag and the um, acoustic tag returns. So you right. could, at least with the acoustic tag returns, you could pretty quickly discover whether or not the DSM-2 model, with some appropriate behavior, is generating a similar distributional pattern. Uh, yeah. Because you know more complicated uh, hydrodynamics at junctions um, means you have to then infer other kinds of complicated behavior to uh, put into the model of those, and that sometimes getting more complicated doesn't necessarily give you a better uh, qualitative result. Right. Yeah, and there's all the trade-offs in terms of execution time, and it's a balancing act. It's an art. But yeah, that that is what we're doing uh, right now. We're we're just focusing on the coded wire tag data as sort of a first pass. But we have a number of releases, and then we have information on how many how many of the fish were recovered at Chips Island, and then how many of them were recovered at the salvage operations. Um, hmm. And so, I, I think it's interesting. I, I guess if it was me, I would have started with uh, acoustic tag data um, because you get a much finer grained picture of the pattern and your uh, model of the movement of the fish in the delta is giving you a fairly fine-grained picture, which you can't get from the CWT stuff. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not super familiar with what's available in terms of the acoustic tag data, but is there, in terms of just the amount of data that's available, how does it compare to, to what's available with the coded wire tag data? Well, there are many fewer fish tracked, but the information on where they were at different times in the delta is yeah. available, which isn't available from the CWD data. Right. Yeah, and that's something I think um, we're going to be looking at fairly soon, is looking at the actual paths of individual fish using the acoustic telemetry data to sort of try to infer what it is that's driving their behavior. Sure, but just thinking about the stuff that David showed, you know, they have a distribution of the acoustic tags after a certain length of time after release, and uh, you know where they released them, you know how they were distributed a week later, uh, yeah. and it seems to me it would be pretty easy to start looking at that in relation to what uh, your model with certain kinds of behavior would predict, particularly with an animal like the steelhead, which are, you know, big and good swimmers, so they're, you would imagine that initially they're going to be less driven by the flows. Yeah. Yeah, I think ultimately we're going to have to use information from all of these. Because um, one challenge, I think, is going to be uh, having patterns that you see in the data and then potentially having multiple different processes that could give rise to those same patterns. So I think that's where something like the acoustic telemetry data, either at the distributional level or tracking individual fish like very, very closely, Coupled with the coded wire tag data, I think all of these are going to have to inform inform the model to ultimately distinguish between the multiple different behaviors that could give rise to the same sort of pattern. Just let me ask David in that context: If you're looking at uh, the, your uh, CWT data, or sorry, your uh, acoustic tag data, 
uh, in those junction areas that you were examining, if you're looking at individual fish, you can figure out what they were doing at particular times, right? And so you could relate that to the uh, actual uh, flow patterns at that time from DSM-2 rather than averaging over uh, three days or seven days. Yeah, you, you really have a lot of uh, temporal res uh, resolution to the data. Um, so there's a lot more you can do with it, as you were mentioning. So um, as you said, there's not as much code wire tagging, but it's much um, a better quality source to get as much information on the behaviors and movement patterns and temporal patterns of the data. So it's something um, we're using a lot in our modeling efforts at uh, Cream for Sciences. Do you, just out of curiosity, do you I mean with the acoustic tag data, can you see kind of any hot spots of mortality? It seems like one of the things that that data also might help constrain the mortality term in the model. If they're, you know, in, even almost at a, you know, some subsection, I imagine, for example, for a smolt, Frank's track might be much worse than some other places, hypothetically. Could I just comment on that? Yeah, it's great because you get the resolution of your acoustic receiver arrays, which we can be pretty extensive now in the delta that's very well studied. But then you can do those mobile surveys to get even finer spatial resolution. Um, so there's a lot of information gleaned from those tags. We found it useful to think about uh, fish movement through a complex flow field in uh, analog terms to a person hiking. Uh, and the CFD model is replaced by digital elevation. Uh, replaces a fish. So now you're going through spatial complexity, and we understand that because we, we move through that environment. It's a little harder to understand the fisher's environment. So if I have a nice, gentle path that, that goes through a rolling uh, landscape, then my digital elevation map doesn't have to be very accurate. It can be plus minus. You know, contour is going to be 10 feet, and, and it would be really, really useful. Uh, the, the parallel analog to that hydraulically is if you have a simple U-shaped channel and, and there are no uh, hydraulic complexities in it, the fish doesn't exhibit its uh, full behavioral complexity, and you can simulate that with a 2D model. You can simulate it with a 3D model. You, you can uh, simulate it a lot of different ways. You basically get the same answer. Uh, then going back to the analog with the digital elevation map, if you have a complex path to, say, the Rocky Mountains, uh, and your pathway isn't that clear, then the resolution in your digital elevation map becomes very important, and nuances will, will uh, uh, predict where you'll go specifically. Uh, the same is true hydraulically. So there are a lot of uh, very discrete hydraulic features in a channel, and, and fish will respond to them. Then you get into the hydraulic complexity uh, that uh, Steve's talking about. So part of the art and skill in doing the biophysical modeling is to figure out the minimum complexity of the CFD model uh, that you have to use relative to what you anticipate behavioral complexity of the fish will exhibit. Now, uh, there is an argument, which I initially uh, was the opposite end of the spectrum uh, from, from Doug. I, I thought we should start with... Uh, uh, the, the, the full behavioral repertoire and figure it out as opposed to building up from the simplicity. But the reality is in between uh, because if you have the, the full behavioral complexity but in a simple system, what you have is an over-parameterized model for a simple system and you get simulated behaviors that don't actually uh, occur. So again, the art and skill in this is to match the behavioral model with the model that simulates the, biophys the physical uh, environment. So anyway, I hope that helps you a little bit to better visualize your, your problem. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. Um, you, can, you can add complexity in the biology. You can also add complexity in the hydrology, because we know that both of those are simplified in the model. So yeah, that is a trick to figure out um, which is better and what is, what is the appropriate balance between complexity and simplicity on both of those axes, biological and hydrological. And it is also interesting, to, your metaphor about the hiker, it's interesting to think about that in the delta because in some sense upstream might be like these rolling hills and then as you get into the delta with the complex tidal flows, maybe it's more like the Rocky Mountains. So... Yeah. John, if you speak now, you're going to cut into the next speaker's time. <laughs> it's you. Oh, no, are you next? No, I'm 
<laughs> no, okay. Um, I just wanted to offer up some data. We actually, in 2013, put out uh, ADCPs at Turner Cut. Um, yeah, I think just Turner Cut. So we've got a measurement of the hydrodynamic complexity, and then, of course, we've got fish moving through under those same circumstances. So you could exercise your model against the hydrodynamics and then also exercise your particle tracking model against the uh, arrival times. Yeah. 